in giving a warm welcome to our moderator, creator, writer, and executive producer, Sam Shaw. And also um, the star of Manhattan, John Benjamin Hickey. already sat on your microphone. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. It's really fantastic. I've never been in this theater before. But very it's thrilled one. to be here. Yeah, I've never been here either. Uh, no, this is very exciting to me. Uh, first of all, people don't often ask me to moderate anything. Um, but, uh, but also, uh, you know, over this last year, I've stored up a great many questions. That, uh, uh, and uh, so now I have a chance to spring them all on you, because um, we were busy uh, making a TV show. Um, yeah. Uh, so there are a bunch of things I'd love to talk about, but one of them just to get started is about just how we came to be here, um, how we got here, how you found the show, how we found you, what that process was like for you. So I'm I'm nervous. Not I mean I'm nervous to be in front of a group of people, but usually when you, somebody's moderating something, it's somebody who doesn't have much of an association with the show, <laughs> so you can be like bullshit actor authority on everything. Um, no, I but, feel like this should be like gestalt therapy for us. Yeah, it's time yeah. for us to confront all of the demons in this very fraught not relationship. Not in this case. I will not be authoritative about this show in front of you. And I will pass a lot of this on to you, Sam. Um, I uh, came to this project because um, I was sent... Well, I'll talk about what we talked about today because it's a roundabout thing and I think that's maybe why I'm here. Um, it came my way um, maybe three or four months um, like around September, October, and I w had already, I'd been on this show called The Big C for a four or five years, and it was a great show. And, um, and I, 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 thought, I thought I wanted to, to take some time off and maybe do theater or you know, movies or whatever, and do another comedy. If I was gonna do something, I wanted to do a comedy, and this was a show about the bomb, and, and it sounded so serious. <laughs> And, um, it's a half hour. About yeah, yeah, about exactly. <laughs> nuclear apocalypse. A multicam. It's a, about, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I said that I read it, and I finally confessed to Sam today. I didn't even really. He, read he it. actually I, didn't read it. Here was my experience. My side of all this is that we started talking about um, all these roles, and 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 this was the role that we started talking about first out of the gates, and among the first names we talked about was. Um, was John's name, and I was a big fan of John's. That sounded really fascinating. And then we were told that um, he'd read it. He'd read it first of all, which is <laughs> we were told that he'd read it. Uh, and then we and then we were told that John wanted to do a comedy, which I get um, because John is very brilliant uh, and uh, comic actor. And that's not precisely you know at least it wasn't obvious on the page I of the draft of this first. Yeah. Um, uh, and so then John disappeared for um, quite a while. Yeah, and then uh, it came back to me like in January and there were two scripts and I read them and I just devoured them and I loved them so much and, uh, and I then, it got, was a very fast track to getting the job. I went in and met with Tommy and Sam for a good long hour and then I did that obligatory network test. You know, you leave a meeting like that, you're like, it's mine, I'm gonna get it. And they're like, okay, now you have to come in and actually jump through more hoops of fire, but that's an actor's, you know, um, life. And, uh, and I feel very strongly that, I wasn't saying no, I wasn't playing some kind of end game with them like Frank Winter would have. Uh, <laughs> I, I just know that my timing, timing is everything, as I guess everybody in the audience knows in show business, timing, is everything. And the time that I came in and the enthusiasm and passion that I had for the material married to where they were in the process was um, fortuitous and expeditious and a lot of really great things worked in my, in my favor. But, I mean, you know, it's all about the material. It's, it's you know, I, I read it and I was like, I, I don't, I, 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 this is unbelievably challenging, an unbelievably great part, and only an idiot who only wanted to do a comedy would not want to do this. <laughs> and they were so like, I we can all, make it a comedy. Yes, Does he want exactly. it to be a comedy? What there have been moments, yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, so John came in, we sat down, we met, and uh, it was a very odd thing for me because I'd written the first draft of the first uh, hour of this show many years ago, like five or six years ago. And so I'd been living with this character and had a sense of who he was and that had evolved. 
And then John came in and it just was like I knew that that was, that was Frank, that was it. Um, uh, although, um, and this is a fascinating thing that I'd love to talk more about. I mean, John taught me so much about who this character is and my whole understanding of who Frank is and who he could be and how, what the potential was changed and it became this other thing in the process of, of working with you and learning from your approach to the character. But so, um, so let's just talk about what happened next. So you were cast and then what was, uh, you know, there was a period of time, I'm trying to remember exactly how many months, but there was some time before we started. And so what was that process like? I mean, you've done period before, but yeah. like, did you research? Is that part did of your I research? thing? Is it, what happened? I mean, I, you know, I don't know an actor who paid attention to physics in high school. <laughs> I mean, that's why we are actors. <laughs> is because we weren't smart enough to go uh, and I was, you know, science was after lunch. This was the 70s. I was, don't, you know, what, you know what we were doing at lunch. In the, so, yes, I mean, yeah, it was, it was nuclear physics. I mean, it was, you know, and also I didn't, you know, one of the great, I've said this before, but one of the greatest gifts of being an actor and getting a job like this is you do get to go back to school and you get to take it seriously and you get to immerse yourself in, in a, uh, either a, you know, something like nuclear physics, which I did, and as much as I possibly could, as much as my mind would wrap itself around. And, um, and that time and place, you know, so yeah, that's when, that's the most exciting part. And uh, the waiting is the hardest part, but also in many ways, it's the most exciting part. We've all, we all know that, waiting for a job, because at that point, it's all potential. So you're thinking you know, in these wonderful abstracts, and you're not there in the middle of the desert in you know, New Mexico fighting dust storms. And, uh, and so yeah, I mean, it was, I think I was kept probably January or early February that I, I the deal closed and I got it and uh, then I was there in March. So there wasn't that much time um, before we started and that's probably a good thing because the uh, nature of this material is week after week after week you're shot out of a cannon, you know. I mean, so many jobs you look at and you're like, how am I going to make this work? This was, how am I going to make this work? You know, because it was just so exciting and so outside of my, my uh, comfort zone. Well, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's interesting to me, I was talking to Tommy, uh, Tommy Shlami, our director, earlier today, and he was saying, you know, one thing that was interesting to him about this process is, when we started, we had these scripts for the, we had a banked a bunch of scripts uh, for the first, you know, five or six episodes, although you guys didn't see them. We, were, so we sort of hoarded them. We kept them very close to the vest, and we were still working on them, which part of the deal is that, uh, you know, we were writing blind, and then we knew who our cast was, and we were learning how to produce the show and, and, and how to uh, make sure that the show is going to be producible on our schedule and on our, you know, budget and et cetera. But, um, but for those first couple of episodes, it was sort of like we were doing a play at first when we got together, you know. In fact, the first thing we did is we had a table read, you know, yeah. as you do when everybody flew in. It's sort of like the weirdest first date ever when you're, you know, you sort of do the thing where, uh, you know, Olivia Williams was Skyping in from London and I don't know what time it was there, but she had a glass of wine and I was like, I would kill for a glass of wine right now. For God's sake, like, where's my glass of wine, I Olivia? Wanna, yeah, I want to tell that the great story on Tommy, the great legendary Tommy Shlami who is... Uh, yeah, just and the, his work on this show is the world he created is uh, is just it's amazing and um, and you know that going back to casting, you, you know the, the, that's also great credit to the WGN because they let you guys build an ensemble of people who weren't necessarily proven, certainly not television stars, you know, and and let the pretty much a cast of unknowns and that's very very unheard of and was a big leap of faith on their part and I have such, you know, I'm so grateful obviously for, um, for them letting Tommy and Sam have this freedom and Tommy did not want to do a table read because that's the two most dreaded words in the English language for an actor <laughs> are fucking table read. You're like, oh my God. And Tommy said, Tommy balked and balked and I'm right about this. He said he finally agreed to do it for all the suits and of course they should have a table read. They're the one who've written the checks and you know. Um, 
And he said, I will only do, I will do it on one condition, that you cannot talk to me about the actors afterwards. These are the people I've chosen. You will not replace anybody based on a table read. And I think most of us know that that's just the way it is these days. They do a table read and somebody has to get fired. It's like, you know, that just seems like to be part of the job. Like somebody's not doing their job unless an actor gets fired from a table read. And it's like it's a table read. It's, it's just us looking at the script, saying the words, you know, and trying not to vomit, you know, because we're all so <laughs> nervous. Um, so the, I, I, that was done against Tommy's, you know. No, it was, well, he, I think he is, a, a, is like, a, um, a, uh, like a great papa bear when it comes to sure his cast. I mean, he has such... Um, love and admiration and respect for actors, and he feels very protective toward them. He's married to one. He was one. Did you know that? Like Tom, his entree into this whole yeah, thing, which so, yeah. his great story that he loves to tell is that, like in high school in Texas, um, the one room that was air conditioned was like the theater room. So he was like, ah, "Fuck it." I mean, he was like a football player, but he's like, "It's so cold in there," you know. So he went and he became an actor. And he was saying to me recently, you know, I went in for different reasons. <laughs> So, but it, but uh, but you know, so so that's all to say, it's absolutely true. I mean, he just he wanted to be sure that this was, uh, you know, part of the thing is when you launch a venture like this, um, it sounds super cornball, and there's no way to say it without sounding really corny. But you're kind of creating a family. If it's going to work, it's going to be. And everybody, TV, the schedules are so crazy and punishing. Um, uh, the only way that it's ever any good at all is if everybody is bring everything they have, and everyone's going to get tired and not have enough. You know, the, the departments aren't going to have enough money to do the cost of anything they want to do or to build the set. But you get, so everybody, you have to set that tone from the start. And I credit Tommy. Um, I mean, he, he, it meant a huge amount to him to set that tone in the right way. And when we did have the table read it, you know, it felt, um, I, I, was, I was very nervous. Um, for my because in the end, you know, Tommy made it clear. Look, this is not about the actors and assessing the actors. So it's really just about assessing the words I'd written on the page. Yeah. So could they, was, ever, could they was, ever replaced you? So it was. I mean, it's God. You never know. You never know. So, but so we all got in that room, which is and had that experience of you know seeing Alexia, who plays Callie, you know, go up to the Skype thing and say, "Nice to meet." Where's my mom? Who's who's my mother going to be for the night? And doing that whole thing. Um, and how do you how did you feel after that? How did you, what's your, at the end of it, was it? Great relief, N not that it was over, but that I wasn't gonna hear the phone ring saying, you know, they've decided to replace you, no. Um, uh, yeah, incredibly excited, you know, I couldn't wait to get started. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I, you know, I'm superficial enough to where, as much as I loved the table read, it was my costume fitting that was really like, <laughs> I mean, how great are the clothes, really, seriously? And the guy who did the g brilliant Alonzo costume. Alonzo's a genius, yeah. Alonzo Wilson, who did The Wire and uh, was responsible for so much of the look of that. And, um, you know, period pieces are the, they're, they're so great because the clothes make the man and that hat was so much fun to wear. And <laughs> we, let's not talk about that. Should we talk about the hat? No. Uh, uh, well, so, so, so uh, we do the table read and then we went to New Mexico and Tommy had this sort of vision for how we should approach that first uh, couple of weeks. Because we did have some time to rehearse. Uh, and we, you know, we sat down on the first day and it was, it, this was our own table read just for us. You know, just to hear the words and act it out and we didn't have enough actors and so, you know, uh, I was even conscripted into read some horrible, you know, I, like I, we were all in it together and it was yeah. fun and felt like a play. Um, uh, so one question that I'm just very curious about is, did you, during that period, feel like you were making discoveries about the character and about Frank? Like, at what stage um, do you think you found this guy and found the life that you brought to him? Um, uh, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but I think in some ways, uh, never. <laughs> he was so brilliantly mysterious and, um, and uh, Tommy and and uh, Sam made a point, and this a little bit. Uh, it sounds like you know you have to keep actors in the dark as much as possible, and we tend to balk at that. I tend to balk at that, but but they kept they kept um, what was going to happen away from us. They knew what we were going to end up doing. Who was going to be the spy? Who was going to be a good guy? Who was going to be a bad guy? But we never knew, and. Uh, and you know, whenever anybody says, "But that doesn't it doesn't work that way," people always mention Casablanca was, of course, unscripted. The end, nobody knew the ending. They wouldn't tell her. And a lot of people say that one of the reasons why Bergman's performance pops off the screen so much is she's so anxious about 
not knowing what she's playing. She doesn't know who she's supposed to be in love with. And I mean, that's a pretty good, you know, testament to keeping actors um, ignorant. But, uh, but um, you know, I, I think it was so, it was such a challenging step-by-step uh, -step journey. The pure science alone and trying not to look like an idiot writing on the chalkboard. I would be like, you know, can you say action at the point at which I'm just ending the parentheses? <laughs> you know, I, Jim Parsons is a friend of mine, uh, Jim Parsons, who's, you know, of course, so genius on his show. And I talked to him about that. He was like, never let them see you actually writing an equation. You're always finishing the equation. Um, I, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and somebody else, like a science guy, has come up and you know, done it for you, uh, but you, you, you I, I, in all seriousness, it was so overwhelming that to think elliptically was, was very dangerous because you could get very overwhelmed very, very quickly, especially in those first two weeks. You know, you're, we all, I don't know how many actors are in the audience, but, but you know, you're nervous, you're nervous the first few days. You're, go, you're, you're, you're going in between, you know, wow, that was so good, I'm gonna buy a house in the country because this is gonna run. <laughs> and within, within uh, 30 seconds, you're, who are they gonna replace me with tomorrow? Because that was, and, and Tommy is a taskmaster and demanding, and I believe actors, I love having somebody else in charge. And, and speaking to that, it was, it, I was happy not to make it my business because, I don't know, I mean, I say it's because I'm from the theater, but that can sound so pretentious, I like, not feeling like I'm running, like I'm in charge of anything. I like just showing up and as being as myopic as possible because I can think too, uh, you know, I can think too much of the gestalt and really, really screw myself up. Well, that's, I mean, the thing that's crazy to me about that process for you guys is you, so you get a new script every week and a half or something like that, um, uh, and you get it a week before we shoot. And um, you know, we would not talk through uh, where the story was going. Um, uh, are there? I mean, it's basically the antithesis of the theater. If you're doing, you know, if you're doing uh, a play that you live with, and you know, um, is there? Are there any gifts in that process? Like, I mean, at some level, uh, um, I guess you have to surrender yourself to the moment of what's in front of you immediately. That's it. But I think that that's the biggest gift, and it's as simple as that. It's being alive to the possibility of the moment. You know, just trying, just, you know, learning your lines, doing your homework, <clears throat> and then leaving all your homework, besides the, your line memorization, behind, and giving yourself to the other actor and listening and talking as simply as possible. And when a script is as good as the scripts were, these scripts were, it, it doesn't matter if you don't understand this. I mean, if, you know, you want to, but you surrender to how great, wonderful the writing is and how great the dynamic is between the other actors. And this was such an extraordinary group of actors. I mean, Olivia Williams, who plays, you know, Liza, is just, it's just it's such a gift to be able to work with somebody so brilliant. And you want to work with people better than you. I mean, I've always felt that way. You want to work with people who you think are a whole lot better than you are. And then you shut up and just try to, you know, keep up. Um, uh, that, I mean, that was the experience for us. It was just such a gift to be able to write for this cast. It was incredible. And this um, wasn't a cast, I mean, I think you guys have said this and I can speak to it as well. There was no uh, bad apple, nobody was, there were no assholes in this group. There were- like, No, there was not a single everybody. asshole. I kept like, there was like, look around and if you can't tell who the asshole is, it's you. So I was like, am I the asshole? Who's the exactly. asshole? Um, you know, um, but no, there was not a single asshole. And you know, I, I knew I was gonna come and do this and, uh, and I don't, I'm not an actor and I don't, but you know, to, you know, uh, to talk to an actor in front of actors. And so one thing I did, I had a couple conversations with, uh, which I was, happened to be happening uh, happening anyway, happily, but I talked to a couple of our cast members and I said, well, what would you ask John? What would you like to know from John? And one, uh, Harry Lloyd asked a question that was, that uh, I loved, it was great. I mean, what he said was, what I would ask, one thing I would ask is, he said that you were so brilliant at setting a tone right from the outset where everyone felt um, so safe and so comfortable and so, and, and there was such enormous respect for the work and, you know, and so his question was, um, which is a question I have too, which is how do you, what's that job like? How do you approach the process of um, being the lead on a big ensemble and, and you know, what, is, is it different? Was that different? Were the, uh, the role on set and off set, did you feel a different kind of responsibility? Um. 
I don't know, one time I said, um, you know, I, I wasn't boasting or anything, but I was like, you know, I'm number one on the call sheet. And my partner who's a, here and he's a writer on Modern Family and he's brilliant and hilarious. And he's like, you know, I don't think you should let anybody else hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> you, should maybe, you should maybe never, ever say that again. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I really think that, I, I mean, I'm, again, I don't mean to sound like, you know, fake m actor modesty. <laughs> Um, it it's, was, the, the tone was not set by me, it was set by Tommy. Tommy is a great coach and a fearsome leader. I mean, he's, he's not scary, but he's big and he's demanding. And loud. And loud. He's the loudest oh human being. I, we were doing a sex scene that got cut. Um, it wasn't sex scene, but it was a post-coital scene, um, and that got that got cut. And 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 it was—I wouldn't even say what it was, but it was very, very quiet. Of course, intimate scene. And Tommy's whispering to the camera guy, but in full voice. And finally, I was like, you know, Tommy, I can. I, your your whisper is actually everybody else's full voice voice. So you know, I can hear everything you're saying. Um, no, I, I mean, I I look. I was very happy to get the job. I'm not a kid. You know, I got this job at 50 years old, and it was an unbelievable opportunity, and I've been in this business long enough to have been incredibly grateful for it and to know I had to work my ass off. But that wasn't because I have to work my ass off because I want everybody else to, I was just looking out for myself. I was just, I was just, you know, I've been, you know, it's what you do. It's just what you do. So I, I don't think any of that was was difficult because I thought we had such great leadership, you know. We had such great leadership in you and Tommy, um, and uh, a crew also that yeah, was tireless and yeah. They were incredible, but I think you're being very humble. I, it 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 I, it um it meant a great deal. I mean, it meant a lot to us as 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 writers to sort of feel like um, we wanted to be better because of that work. The only time amazing. we talked about this today, the mm -hmm. only time I got a little shirty minty, as Olivia Williams would say, um, was um, there was a period of time when there was just so much going on and you guys were not behind, but behind the eight ball. We were episode nine, 10, 11, and Tommy and Sam weren't around very much. And little bitty changes were being made that were, I thought, not, I don't even know if I thought they were affecting the big picture, but I was, I felt left to my, like, I, I don't know, do I think it's a good idea to lose these two lines? That's not my decision. I, that should be somebody else's decision, not mine. I mean, if it, as an actor, if I feel like the rhythm's not right, I can say, but I, I didn't write this. I could never pretend to have written this, and I need the person. I just wanted to feel like somebody was, was there who was in charge and with an eye on the bigger picture, and that was the only time. So maybe it does. That was amazing. I mean, this is, so this is a time, you know, for us, where we're, for everyone, you're sort of in the thick of it, and you're churning out scripts, and you want to maintain the quality, and we had this complicated thing, which is we're shooting in New Mexico, and our offices are here, right, and right. Um, so, you know, I, or Tommy, or uh, Dusty Thomason, who's another writer and executive producer on the show, tried to be out there as often as we could, had to have one of us be there just as a sort of continuity presence. But there was a period when we weren't there, and so yet John called me and said, you know, we need to talk, here's the situation, and you well, know. I was I, a little, I was kind of tough. Well, here's the thing, we had this conversation, <laughs> and like two days, it was, by the, by the way, it was like the most reasonable uh, request that anyone has heard. It was like, look, we're, we're trying to make the best thing, and, and I feel like it, there are conversations we should be having, and it's really helpful to have you guys here, and you know, and. Uh, and we got, and I said the only thing you could say, which is, um, you're absolutely right, and I want to be there. There's nothing in the world, actually, that I would r rather be doing, you know, than to be there. You know, but we're also cutting, and there's posters here. Um, uh, but like two days later, John called and was like, you know, I just, I'm sorry about my tone on that phone call the other day. And I was like, what is this? On what planet? You know, is this? Is this? This is like the the. Anyway, a very Such lovely a nice human being. Guy, Thank yeah. you. Um, and now but I, but I, I would talk to friends who are working on shows, and they'd be like, "An actor is it's a nightmare, isn't it?" And I'd be like, "Yes, it's a, it's a, he's a terror." But he's now terror. today I was, uh, yeah. But today I was like, you know what? You guys can stay away. Season two, we got it. We got this. We're we're good. You guys stay in L.A. Exactly. Um, no. Uh, well, let me ask you this. What I'm curious to um, uh, to hear about too, as an actor. Um, so we had we had these sets uh, that are kind of incredible. That were um, it, this was sort of uh, they were um, built brilliantly by Ruth, our production designer, and Tommy had a really clear sense of how to produce the show. That was you know largely we got to do what the army did and build a town, 
um, you know, you can't shoot this show on stages because it will feel like um, the most expensive high school play ever put on, you know, uh, like there need to, the actors need to be miserable and dusty all the time. So we got very lucky and we found this, um, this piece of property that is, we turned into, you know, an 11 acre, 1940s nuclear apocalypse theme park, basically. It was like and the back lot of a studio, but back in the old days when there was acres and acres of every, you, and Tommy, master of walk and talk, he must have been like a pig in shit. Well, that was the first thing he showed me photos and he was like, there are seven miles of hallways. <laughs> it's like just vision, visioning. It's like Tommy Shlami's wet dream. It's just, you can walk forever. You know, you can like walk until your leg muscles atrophy and you, you know, or whatever. Um, so uh, I was like, how am I going to fill all those pages with dialogue? Um, uh, but so for me, you know, after I'd been living with this and thinking about it for a long time, um, and I had a picture of what this place was, and then when I went and saw it for the first time, it was like, you know, it was one of a handful of those moments where it, you feel like you've been kicked by a horse. It, you're almost emo it's emotional because you're in this, it's like you've had a dream and then it's real and it's a three-dimensional place. And so... Um, we talked about the costumes and the brilliant work that Alonso did, but like, what was it like for you, uh, you know, and, and how helpful was that process? Because it was such a different process of shooting than, a, you know, a, a traditional stage process. Yeah, it's all the difference in the world. I mean, it was instant verisimilitude, you know. It was like, you, you, we all know what it's like, you know, you shoot the exterior and then a week later you're in the interior of that scene when you've walked in and, and you're on a sound stage and, and a window opens and of course it's just, it's just more stage out there and the air is non-existent, it's arid and airless. And, uh, and um, this was literally a, um, you would open a window in, in, and look out a window of a scene, an interior shooting and there was a bunch of background, you know, it, for as, law, as far as you could see, there was the world that you lived in, real, n r not a painted backdrop, you know? So it just was like you really could breathe. It was like, and I also got to smoke, which helps you breathe too. Um, uh, but it was like, it was like it, there's nothing better than smoking in a play because it really, you really get to take big, deep, long breaths. Um, and, uh, and, and this was like that <laughs> without the smoking. It was like you just had, you felt like you had so much oxygen. And I feel like actors on sound stages are fighting lack of oxygen more than anything else. That's the biggest problem. There's not enough air in the room. And you're in a room with not, you know, 15 crew people and you and the other actor, and there's not enough air to breathe. And it makes your brain, you know, go wonky. And this, we did not have that problem. You had real freedom. And you sometimes felt very small in the face of all of that God, you know, around you. I mean, that's one of the, if you've watched the show, I think the, the star of the show, besides Sam's writing, is the unbelievable vistas and, and what a, how much drama there is in the topography of Los Alamos in New Mexico. Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, that, that was something that we felt the writers too, which is that we, uh, you know, you can look at photos and you can, but until you're sort of there and it's like you're, you've crash landed on on you know Mars or yeah. something. I mean, it's like some place between Sergio Leone and like Forbidden Planet. You know, is what it felt like there, um, and it was powerful. I mean, it was a it was um, that was a really profound thing. Um, uh, so let me ask you a couple questions about Frank, about this uh, uh, this uh, character. Um, one question that I'm just curious about is. Uh, uh, Put it this way, you're considerably less of an irascible prick than this man is. Um, uh, uh, I know, I feel like one person in the audience may not agree with <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but he's, a, but he's um, difficult and uh, makes choices that uh, um, affect a lot of people in some pretty complicated and fucked up ways and he leaves a kind of wake of human wreckage around him um, and he has this sort of headlong Ahab-like sense of purpose. Um, so one thing that I'm just curious about uh, for you is do you, do you have to work not to judge that character? Are there moments where uh, you um, feel um, that you as John are um, out of sync with uh, Frank as Frank and what, what's that sort of experience like? Um. Yeah, I, uh, I, I love him so much. And the only time I ever felt, I wasn't out of sync 
was when I thought, I went to Dusty once and I was like, is, tell me, because this was about 11 episodes in, I was like, is he the bad guy? Is he gonna be the spy? Is he gonna be the, because anything's possible in this crazy world they live in. It's Kafkaesque, as one of the characters says. And, and, and he said, that's the big question, is at the end of the day, is Frank Winter a good man or a bad man? And I always thought of him as a, a good man because you know, he's a product of two wars. Did anybody see the Roosevelt's, that amazing documentary? And you know, Franklin was, you know, he was a product of those two wars and, and, and just what an extraordinary character that a guy who had fought in World War I and then at 50 years old finds himself getting the job of his life. The only downside is it's war, you know. He has to go back. So I thought all of his reasons for being the way he was were the right reasons. They were all for the the will of the good, and and for and he really, I think, tr truly believes that the implosion bomb can end the war and end war forever. You know, he had no. It's hard to play something like that without twenty twenty hindsight. You know, um, but uh, I always, you know, I my uncle was D Day too, and <clears throat> my dad didn't get to fight in the war because of a health problem, so I had a huge feeling of nostalgia about the war and about those men and about that sacrifice. You know, and I think in a world where we don't have the same, we don't know what that sacrifice is anymore. And so I never felt like anything ethically he did that was terrible, and there was a lot of terrible shit that he did and does, was questionable. I think, we talked about this as well, I think the thing that weighed on him the most was I don't think he was aware of the psychic and moral fatigue. You know, I don't think he was aware of the Faustian bargain. I don't think he was aware of how much that was gonna weigh on him psychically. And I think that the, the, only, the thing he loves more than his job, the, the fact that he can make implosion work is his wife. And he sees what, you know, and so I think I'm straying off the, 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 the point, the question, but I never, thought anything he did, he was trying to save hundreds of thousands of lives. And that's what those men, there's this amazing documentary called The Day After Trinity about the guys who really built the bomb. And, uh, and you see what, and it's an interview with all the guys at Los Alamos, Oppenheimer's dead at this point, but it was made in the 60s, you should see it. And you see these men give their lives to this um, project because it's what their life calling is. And, um, and you fall in love with these guys. And then when it comes time, when they realize Germany doesn't have the bomb, and they keep going to work and keep building this bomb in spite of all of the moral uh, ramifications, um, it's because it's their life's calling, and that's what he's there to do. I mean, long-winded answer, but no, I never thought he stepped out of line, even when he was stepping out of line. Uh, can I, I lo love what you s say about uh, about Frank's relationship to Liza too. That was a thing that was kind of a revelation to me in the very beginning. Was I feel like you and Olivia very quickly found something that gave me the feeling that there are twenty years of marriage between these two people, and you guys got along great. Yeah, I mean, uh, what was that process she's, like? She's was that sort of hilarious? And I'm a real Anglophile, and she's you know as English as they come, and. And I fell in love with her about the second or third episode. Charlie Isaacs, Ashley's character, says to me, the second or third time, you're just a dinosaur. You're, you're just an old, washed-up has-been. And she came to me, and she's like, darling, you need to tell your agents to tell the writers to stop saying that about you. So, <laughs> so, just not as a character, as an actor. You don't want people thinking that you're washed-up, has-been, old. You're an old man who's over the hill. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you can't, she just is so, she, that, that, you know, we were the senior members of the cast, us and Danny, the brilliant Danny Stern, and, and so I, I think we loved being those parental figures and loved all those young cast members, and that, that was just a really bonding thing. And we were in freaking Santa Fe for four months all by ourselves. A lot of tequila, you know, a lot of, <laughs> she's great, great fun. She's the best kind of actor to work with smart, gets on with it, spends less time in the chair than me, the dinosaur, you know, so it's like, <laughs> she's the best. Um, it was very cool, that was a very weird thing for, for all of us is that I think the experience of making the show weirdly um, 
although I hope less destructive ultimately in the world, was somewhat like the experience of making the bomb and that all these people were thrown together on this kind of desert island and hadn't really known each other and they had this common purpose. And um, yeah. so um, it's very, very, feels very lucky that we get to go back and keep doing this thing with those people. So I got a waved too, which means it's, um, we, we have some questions from the, uh, from we'll you guys. We'll make quick. To, uh, our read, so we don't want to bore you guys. But um, uh, here's one. Uh, can we talk, we've talked about it a little bit, but can you talk about the experience of filming in New Mexico? What was surprising? What was something you didn't expect? The weather. There, there, you know, if one more person said to me, you don't like the weather in New Mexico, wait 10 minutes. Uh, it just, it just, uh, Rosemary Rodriguez, who directed a brilliant episode, is here. And there was a moment, there was a time, I mean, you said action, and it was, it was sunny and warm. And by the time you said cut, it was hailing. It was hailing. <laughs> It was, it was like, you just, you just couldn't believe it. I mean, the weather was um, a, a prohibitive at times, very prohibitive, but also it was incredible drama, you know. It was crazy. Out. That was the thing that Tommy, like Tommy was very much like a kid in a candy store because there, there were these winds would blow through and dust and people, would, you know, all the crew would have these goggles on, but like, you, you know, you poor bastards would be out there trying to do a scene. And, and you would go you know, home at night and I'm not kidding, you would take, have to take a shower to get all the dust off you and you clean your ears, you'd be like, oh my God. It just, it gets in every pore, every, yeah. No, it was crazy. And Tommy would be like, you cannot, you literally can't pay for those production values. It's yeah, incredible, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. Um, so we're very And then of course you would do a thing in a big, huge dust storm and you were just acting so brilliantly because you could, because you know, God was upstaging you. So there was no, you couldn't overact enough. And, and, then, and then I would talk to one of you guys, I'd be like, how does that scene look in that dust storm? And you're like, you can't really tell the wind's blowing. And you're like, what? <laughs> Fuck, yeah. So, you know. Uh, so here's one which uh, we can both feel, but the question is, is the storyline historically accurate, somewhat accurate, or fictional regarding the lives of the characters? So oh, you go. Um, the deal for us with the show was, um, uh, you know, we didn't have a sort of hard and fast set of rules or a kind of algorithm for, you know, where do we diverge from the historical record, where don't we? But the, the idea from the beginning was to um, to create this rich and detailed and researched historically accurate stage on which fictional characters play out their stories. And, um, you know, that was by design. There, there's been a huge amount written about, um, particularly the sort of big names that you read about in the history, about Oppenheimer and about General Groves, who uh, was this sort of opposite on the military end. Um, but uh, we were much more interested in the question of what it was like for everybody else in this town. And in particular, uh, you know, what it was like, what the family dimension of that was. What is it to, you know, that was the thing that was so fascinating to me was the idea that these people who are building this thing that the rest of humankind would reckon with forever couldn't talk about it with the people that they, you know, that ordinarily would be your support mechanism, I guess. You know, use a very 2014 term to describe it. So um, so that was the, the, the sort of the idea from the beginning was that the character stories are fictional and to find ways for the characters to open a window into the history. Um, and that it was a secret and that it was kept a secret and that it actually worked. You know, there's no such thing as secrets anymore. There's no such thing as a private place. And this was the beginning of that. This was the birthplace of a, you know, kind of privacy being sanctioned by the government. You know, I mean, well, that's totally true. I mean, it's part of that irony was so fascinating to me too, which is that um, that this the world's biggest secret was kept in a place where nobody could keep a fucking secret because you all lived together on top of each other. It was you know Tommy his analogy that he would always use is that, like it's like steerage on the Titanic. You know, everybody's quarters or you know you can hear the fight on the other side of the wall, and and so you know it was. It's a good thing we got picked up, or that description would have been. You know, sad. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, that, no, it was like our whole, the whole thing from the beginning. Like you could read the headlines. It is like Manhattan is a bomb. You know, it explodes in W. You know, ha happily it didn't happen. Um, so uh, um, let's see. Um, this is for you. Uh, how did you research the character? You know, what kind of research was involved, um, both in terms of the period and in terms of the science? Um, um, do you use the method for your acting or any other technique? Uh, I read, I, I tried to read, I'm not finished, I won't lie. I, the Making of the Atom Bomb, which is the most brilliant Richard Rhodes, it's the Bible. And I'm, I'm halfway through it. Um, 
And uh, the, the great Jeanette Conant, but is that the 110 East Palace? 109 East Palace, yeah. Uh, so there are amazing social histories about this time and place, and they are so, they're like Vanity Fair articles. They're, they're, they're so enjoyable and filled with gossip and, and uh, unbelievably rich characters. And, um, and I also, and I'm not kidding, I, uh, I had pay-per-view on my TV there, and you could buy movies, and I swear I watched Casablanca like five times, because first of all, it's the best movie about sacrifice and about the war, and about people giving themselves up for, for the better good, the common, you know, and, and you just, I would be like, I wanna be like Paul Henri, I wanna hold my cigarette like Paul Henri does. How does, how does he, how does Bogey do it? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think immersing yourself in that period of time, it's so, it's so fun to do with, with the great movies from that time because shit was better then. Um, this is a question from uh, Sonia, who uh, is here tonight, who, who played, uh, who plays Malka, who plays the uh, the uh, cousin of of uh, Abby um, in the Ellis Island scene at the beginning of this episode. Hi, Sonia. Um, uh, very brilliantly. And the question is, at the end of season one, Frank makes a big decision and a big sacrifice. What's his motivation, considering that he and Charlie didn't have a very warm relationship? And it's true, they have a very kind of complicated relationship. Yeah, we, we talked about that. You know, at the time, it felt like I was trying to relieve myself of a huge burden that had become psychologically, emotionally, psychically, whatever, just too much. I just was... I, w I don't think I was, I, at the time it seemed like I wasn't tired of being the bad guy. I was just tired, you know, and I couldn't keep it straight anymore. And, but I was telling Sam today, watching it, and this is a testament to how brilliantly complicated the emotional lives of these characters are, I feel like, if I can s say that myself. Um, I realized, you know what, I think maybe he did it for his wife because he knew this was gonna kill her that she had to have some purpose. She was going crazy, she already is a little nuts. And he's the only, she's the only thing he loves in the world, it's his daughter and, and, and he maybe loves her even more than work. This is where Casablanca comes in. And he wasn't willing to, um, and, and by telling her, he didn't have to tell her. He could have gotten her out of the room and confessed, but I think he does it for her because now, and I don't know what you guys are planning on doing with her, I think the exciting thing, for that character, and I think she's so such a brilliant character, is now she's on the inside. Now she knows, so they have to do something with her. And I think at the end of the day, it was more, you know, you have to make politics are all, you know, local, and, and it was specifically about that when I watch it, but that's, you know, seems to be so very self-aggrandizing, but I, 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 you know, I think it was for love. I think it was for love. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, the history behind Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project uh, is uh, both fictional and it's non uh, and nonfiction. Right? There's fiction in our show, and your character's portrayal fits into the myth of the events. And so this question is, this is question. It's, it's it's a tough one, I but that's why we're here hard. to ask you the tough ones. <laughs> Do you see your character as a mythological player? Uh, in this bigger than life story, and uh, how did you prepare and evolve in that role? I skipped mythology class too in high school. I, I was stoned in that too. Um, I don't know. You answer that question. I think you're you created Frank Winter. You know, you're you're. You, that's a good question for you. Uh, you know, uh, here's what my answer would be, and I don't know what you I mean, I, the only answer that I can give is, uh, I, that, that's, it's an incredibly interesting question, actually, it's a fascinating question, but at least for me in writing it, and I don't know for you in playing it, but if I had thought about it in those terms, it wouldn't have ever been possible to write the scenes or figure it out. You know, there's a, a w odd way in which I think, um, in writing, uh, I mean, I would be a terrible, terrible, terrible actor, but you have to do we have to do one thing, which is to try to be as deeply immersed in the point of view of every one of those characters to write them as we possibly can. And so um, uh, thinking about it, you know, in bigger grand terms, you know, from the top down would have made it very hard to write those scenes and figure out, you know, what the character wants in that moment, you know, and what, um, so. Yeah, very, you can't, it, like I was saying earlier, it's very, it was very hard to think of. Elliptically, you had to really concentrate on the, you know, and I think that speaking of that thing of doing it for Olivia, doing it for Liza, you know, 
I also watched it and I thought, well, maybe he's got some other end game in mind. Maybe he knows that this is the way to get, to save Charlie, but also save himself. I hope. Am I coming back next season? <laughs> uh, I, I, I certainly, uh, uh, my God, I hadn't really thought about that yet. There are no spoilers. I feel like that's a great place to leave that things tonight. Uh, but, um, we've kept you guys too long, but thank you so much. <laughs>